Glad to see y'all. I'm glad to, uh, I praise God and his sovereignty in allowing me to be here uh, tonight. So uh, twist that thing a little bit to the side. So uh, one thing that I've just been uh, really convicted to do just on a Wednesday night, Sunday morning, or Sunday night with our students is just to be transparent with them. And part of that is being vulnerable. And I know that's not our nature to be vulnerable because uh, there's a lot of heartaches that can come with being vulnerable, whether that be with the people that we're talking with or people we're in a relationship with. Um, maybe that some can be used against us, or maybe they start talking about us. We hear rumors, we hear murmuring in the background. But uh, despite all of that, I'm grateful for the opportunity that, that I get to be here um, just on a Sunday night and to be able to, to serve here on staff. Uh, I have loved being with Jonathan, Randy, and Aaron, and uh, James as well, and Kim also, who, who we get to see throughout the week as well. And I'm just grateful to be here. I'm thankful for God's sovereignty and placing me here and appointing me here. But uh, I, I want to look at his sovereignty a little bit. So uh, if you know me uh, uh, very well, or honestly, you don't have to know me that well to know that the, my sending church, the church that sent me here to be with you, is a Candy's Creek Baptist Church. It's in Charleston, Tennessee. And uh, they had the wonderful, bittersweet opportunity to send uh, my student pastor, my youth pastor that, that I grew up under, um, who I even got to intern under as well. They got to send him to East Sonali this morning. And I praise the Lord for, for that example of a church uh, not looking at other churches for competition, not comparing themselves to other churches, but for equipping, training, and sending them out. I praise the Lord for that. And so, for a second, I'd just like to uh, talk about a little bit of my upbringing under Jonathan Kyle. And uh, I, might have st I might have told this story before, but it it's one that cracks me up every single time. So, uh, when I had left uh, Bryan College for the year that I was there to go there and play soccer, um, I found myself not very uh, joy-filled anymore. I felt myself pursuing things that God wouldn't have wanted me to be pursuing uh, to begin with. And, uh, and so whenever I left there, I had felt uh, a yearning to be back in community, uh, to be back in fellowship with his church and with Candy's Creek specifically. And so uh, the only way I can... Uh, even convey what that was, was just, it was just an act of God to get me to feel the conviction and the weightiness to be with his church and his people. And so even though I had gone wayward, he was very grace-filled and very kind in bringing me back. And I praise him for that uh, daily. And so whenever I got back, and that was, uh, I believe, 2018, the fall of 2018, uh, or even winter 2018, I remember having a conversation with Jonathan Kyle, my youth pastor at the time. And, uh, and I remember telling him that, uh, that I had felt called to the student ministry. And, uh, you know, he didn't freak out then, but he later, I later found out that he was just like, hold on, he's, he's just disappeared, he's gone somewhere else, he hasn't been consistent, hadn't done anything, but yet here he is back again. And so I'm grateful for his obedience to the Lord and for his obedience to his word and to the Spirit in allowing me uh, to serve under Him and to be loved and known by Him. And so uh, I, as I just, as I pondered just God's sovereignty uh, in all of it and just looking at Jonathan's life and, and Him giving me men to imitate, uh, to be more like this, His Son, Jesus Christ, because I look at uh, just what it means to be a disciple, what it means to disciple people, and the generations that come after that. So I just think about the generations that were before Jonathan. You know, the people who discipled Jonathan, the people who trained those people, who trained those people all the way back to, I mean, my, my mind keeps going and going and going just to the first 12. And so I'm thankful for just uh, the spiritual generations uh, that, that, that I've been able to see. And I'm grateful for the spiritual generations that have been before us here at North Edwall, and for the generations to come. And so just in honor of him, uh, his whole, uh, his motto, uh, his conviction is out of James one twenty two, which his motto is applying God's word to life until it becomes a lifestyle. So tonight what I want to do, just in honoring him and in honoring 
Candy's Creek sending him out. And I praise the Lord for that example. Uh, I would like us to look at James 1.22. Somebody pray for our time. Uh, God, we, we love you and we thank you. Um, I, I praise you specifically for your sovereignty in just allowing me to get sent here. And uh, the sovereignty in, in Jonathan getting sent out as well. Uh, Father, I, I pray for him and his family um, that, that the people there love him well and that they love your people there well as well. And so I, I thank you for placing me here and for putting me in relationships with students and parents and grandparents and staff. Uh, Father, I, I felt loved by these people. And so I pray that these people feel loved by me. And just as we go to your word tonight, I pray that your word is clear to us and that you give me clarity uh, on, on, on what the Spirit is guiding people to do. And I thank you for being a God of clarity and not a God of confusion. So we love you, we thank you, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so James 1, chapter 1, uh, verse 22. So here's what James writes. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And in verse 23 it says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. It seems pretty straightforward. And and I love the clarity that that James' letter brings us. So, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, that, that is a verse that has resonated with me on just a totally different level. Um... Because the importance for us not to just come and hear it, or not just to come to his word, which is actually the word here, this is the gospel. So don't be just hearers of the gospel, but be doers of the gospel. Now this can also be be applied to scripture. Don't be just a hearer of the word, or don't be just simply a reader of the word, but be a doer of the word. And so after hearing him and and his example... And for me to imitate it, for example, when, when I tell you I have looked up to him and, and at such a level and just I've loved his example, I've loved his family's example, where he sits quite literally at Candy's Creek is in that same spot I sit in uh, whenever I'm in here because he has been uh, that worthy of an example to imitate in my life. And so I want to find men that I can imitate and I pray that... Uh, whether you're male or female, that you find somebody worth imitating, somebody worth uh, discipling you, and then people worth discipling as well for you in the future. And so when I look at this passage, uh, a, a lot comes to my mind on just today hearing him speak out of this text that he's been so convicted of. And so at hearing his conviction and his clarity and his love for the word, his love for God, and his love for his people has brought me much joy to be able to imitate it. So just one thing that, that, that I would like to point out just out of this is it's very easy to come here. I tell students it's very easy to come here on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or a Sunday night. It's very easy to listen to somebody dump information on you and just take what you think you need and then go. It's very easy to do that. But it's a lot different when we hear God's Spirit talk to us through His Word, speaking to us through His Word. And it's a lot different to actually then go and do it. When, when I look at my life, I, I pray that my life is seen as somebody who's not just a hearer of the Word, but somebody who does the Word. I don't just want to be filled with biblical knowledge like, for example, if I were to pursue my doctorate, I don't want to pursue a doctorate just to fill my mind with knowledge, but my heart have no conviction at all. In fact, I would rather have no education and feel conviction rather than to store up all this knowledge in my head for me just to never feel any conviction from God's word at all. So different. But when we live in such a society and such a day and age where so much information is at our fingertips and where we're constantly taking things in, we often look away from God's word towards entertainment to fill our time. 
instead of looking to God's word to actually use his word to change our life with his spirit, to kill flesh, to pursue holiness and righteousness and sanctification. But also we can't do that if we don't know anything in his word to begin with. And that's kind of what it goes on to say in verse 23 and 24. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and once forgets what he was like. That's quite literally, if I were to read this text and I were just to read it, and I, and I compare my life to what James's letter is saying, and if I'm not to apply it to my life until it becomes my lifestyle then it's no different than me looking in the mirror intently to make sure what I look like. And the moment that I turn away, I've forgotten what I've looked like. When we, go to the, when we go to God's word, we're not meant to just look at it or just read it. It's very important to look at it. It's very important to read it. But what's all the more important is, am I actually applying this to my life? Is my life being sanctified in such a way to where tomorrow I can look back at today and say, God, I can see how you've already matured me then. How I've matured since yesterday or five years from now. I can look back and say, I'm a totally different person. I can look back five years from now and look at myself and say, what on earth were you doing? I mean, it's the gospel, God's word, it changes our lives It penetrates our lives, it penetrates our minds, our hearts. Everything that we do ought to be out of what God's word tells us to do. And not just for the sake of doing it, but because of our love for him and his people. It's simple, yet it's overlooked so often. So again, I praise God for that example. Uh, I praise God for the men that he's placed in my life. And so uh, another text that is near and dear to my heart is actually the Great Commission as well. So I would like to take a second to look at that also. Because if we're going to apply God's word to our lives, then I'd like to share a text that I've personally felt a lot of conviction with. So Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What an awesome promise that is. Awesome promise that is. So Jesus is going telling his disciples to make disciples of of all nations. A lot of times people will stop right there and will hone in on that and will say, okay, that is just evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. But when we stop for a second and we look at, first, what is a disciple? And what do disciples do? So if Jesus was their rabbi, the goal of a disciple was to be like their teacher. Look at Luke 640. The goal of a disciple was to be like their teacher. Not many are going to be your teacher because we can't literally be like Jesus Or if I was looking to imitate Jonathan, I'm not going to be exactly like Jonathan because I'm a totally different person. God has given me different gifts. He's given me different personality. He's given me a lot of different things. We're not going to look the same. We're not going to talk exactly the same. So that's not possible for us to do. But we can be like our teachers, people who we imitate. I love the word imitate. It means a lot to me. And so when it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the, uh, of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, this is the part that I like to slow down with people. This is the part I've been slowing down with students a lot. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I think a lot of times in our context and in, in our culture, what that looks like is I'm going to put on my master teacher hat And I'm going to give you all the information in the world, but it's up to you on what you're going to do with it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be that way. I've told students, I'm taking off that master teacher hat. I'm not putting it on. Instead, I want to be in a relationship with you. 
Because Jesus, in relationship with his disciples, taught them how to, one, love God, how to love him, and how to love others. Jesus, the new command that he gave to him was, quite literally, Jesus said, A new command I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. That's a lot. That's, I don't know if you feel the weight of that, but that's a lot of weight. So I want you to love each other, the body of Christ, the way that I have loved you. That's selfless. That's intentional. And that's relational. I think oftentimes we look over that relationship part of it because, one, we don't want to be vulnerable. And guess who else is guilty of that? I can be guilty of that. Uh, Oftentimes I am guilty of that. But I am to be relational if I am to make disciples. You can't have one without the other. So I don't just want to be relational without the intention of, I want to help you love God more. I want to help you love his people more. You can't have that. But you also just can't have, okay, well, show up at this time. We're going to go over this, this, and this, and this. And I want you to learn this. And I want you to read this before we come back. And then we'll talk about that without one slowing down with the person and actually seeing where they are. A great friend of mine now, uh, one thing that he says a lot is seek first to understand. So that sounds like something that's really profound. It sounds like something that's really deep, which is it can be very deep for some people. But people want to be loved. People want to feel cared for. And so if we're not making people people feel loved, and we're not making people feel cared for, then we're not doing what we ought to be doing, and we're not taking full part in the Great Commission. Which is when we look at mission, that's just a mission that one single person is doing. But we put that word co, that's a co-mission. And it is that way because of the end of verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And that part to me is just awesome. Because I'm not doing it alone. You're not doing it alone. And that to me is incredible news because I don't have to depend on myself. If I were to depend on myself, it's probably going to go real bad real fast. It's going to go... Real sideways, really fast, and we're probably going to end up in a ditch somewhere, and I may just be like, okay, I've made an absolute mess of this situation. And we may. We very well may. But if we look at our total dependency and our lack of competence, we have no competence without Christ. He said that you can't, essentially, you can't get anything done without me. Anything that is truly for the kingdom cannot be done without me. If we're not relying on his spirit, then we are not doing his work. There's a huge correlation there. So I'm going to say again, if we're not relying on his spirit to do his work, then we are not doing his work. There's a lot of boxes that that we like to check off. but a A box that we oftentimes overlook is the, am I, am I glorifying God? Am I doing this to serve at the pleasure of the king? Am I giving him glory? For example, am I coming here on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or a Sunday night? Am I just begrudgingly just walking in here like, I don't want to be here today? Or am I looking at like, God, I am here to serve you and to serve others. God, I am here to love you and to love others. It's a big difference. I'm not here just for the sake of being here. And I pray you're not here just for the sake of being here. But I pray that you're here to be intentional with God and with his people out of love that you have for him and for them. It's important. It is incredibly important and and we cannot overlook it. So again, when I zoom out and when I look at the examples that God has sovereignly gave me to imitate. I would not be here today without them. I think, I honestly think, because I, I, I'm one who wants to be transparent with people because I want to love God and I love you. So I want to be transparent with you. This year, almost a year, uh, April, I believe, 
I think April 3rd or 4th will be a year since, since my family came here to serve and to love God and, and to love you. And so uh, the past year, it's had its hardships. It's had making new relationships from fresh. It's had its heartaches. It's had its difficult times. But without God and the people that he's placed in my life to imitate, to speak into me, I don't think I would have lasted that long, if I'm being honest. And it's not a other people problem. That's, that's a me problem. Another thing that I've grown, another quote I've grown to love that's been communicated to me is be who you want people to become. Reality hit me hard when I realized that I was not who I wanted others to become. I did not come to his word just, just for growing in a relationship with him. A lot of times I came to his word because I felt like I was lacking in biblical knowledge. And so if I were to be a pastor anywhere, youth pastor, student pastor, whatever you want to call it, if I were to be a pastor somewhere, I felt incompetent if I didn't know enough biblical knowledge that I could just rattle off stuff off the top of my head. But here in, in James, that's not the case. Is biblical knowledge good? 100%. We need to know Scripture. I'm not downplaying that one bit. But if we know Scripture, then our lives ought to look like we know Scripture, and our lives ought to look like we're convicted of God's Word. And so that reality smacked me in the face for somebody that said, I'm convicted to make disciples. I'm convicted to, to do disciple making. And yet, I was not where I ought to be for other people to imitate me. And I say that because I want to be somebody that is worth imitating. Because I want to be transparent with you. I want you to know where my heart is. I want you know, to, to know where I am because again, I'm not here to wear a master teacher hat. I'm here to be in relationship as Jesus was in relationship with his disciples. So a lot of language I use is the language I've learned. The language that I've felt personally convicted of from his word. And God has so graciously given other people grace to give me grace. So I'm not only in relationship, just for relationship's sake, but the relationships that I've entered into with people have not only brought me closer to them, but it's brought me closer to God. And he's shown me that, no, you're not alone. All sometimes you may feel like you're alone in the fight. You're not. When I'm with you, here in verse 20 it says, and behold, I am with you always in the age. I've given you my spirit, but also something that's awesome is how relational God is to give us people to be there in the fight with us. So I, I look at it, and I thank a Jonathan Kyle, and I thank a Stan Gibson, now Alan Peters, and a Brendan Witte for being men that I can truly imitate so that I can imitate Christ. Because if we're to look at the disciples and the generations before us and generations coming after us, Randy, I, I, I heard his message. Uh, I can't remember what the date was, but it is true. He had said that, and I'm pointing to him when I say this because this is what he had said that we're all disciples, but we're either good disciples or we're bad disciples. We're one of the two. So there are people imitating us. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're 10 years old or 100 years old. There's always somebody looking to you. There's always somebody you can come alongside to love for the glory of God. There will always be somebody in our life and, you know, when I just look at when Jesus said, to, when he told his disciples to make disciples of all nations, he quite literally meant all nations. So disciple making is the means to reach the ends of the earth. I don't know if y'all have seen that before. Let me connect those for you. Let me bridge that gap. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Meaning, he didn't say, hey, here's your curriculum, go share it with people. He didn't say that. We're, he didn't say that at all. He said, go make disciples. 
That takes relationship. That takes effort. You know, Paul talks about his striving and his toiling and just the, the, the endless energy and effort. And I think that's something that we commonly are afraid of, that kind of energy and effort, because it's hard. One, it's, it's extremely difficult if we're doing it alone. But what I want you to know is if you're striving for this, you're not doing it alone. One, because Jesus said, I'm with you always. And two, God probably, you can think of off the top of your head, I guarantee it, you could probably think of someone that you can go to at any point in time and know that you're not alone. So if you could think of somebody off the top of your head to know that you're not alone, that's not God himself, that is very important. I'm not downplaying that. Because he's so relational, he gives us relationships to lean into so we can experience his grace and love and mercy through others. And that's huge. So I'm sure you can think of somebody that you can truly go to. I want you to know God has sovereignly placed them there for you. He has sovereignly done that for you because of his love for you and because that glorifies his name. So when, when I come to his word, one thing that I want to do is I want to have an action step. Is I don't, again, I don't want to just come to his word. I don't want to just read it. But when I speak, I don't just want to speak. I want to give an encouragement. I want to give a charge. I want to give a challenge. I want to give an action step on how, from what we've looked at in his word and from what we've read, what is the spirit convicting us to do? So my challenge, my charge, my action step, as you will, is that, one, it's going to be a two-part action step. One, we are intentional to get in his word daily on a regular basis. We are incompetent without Christ. And we are only competent in him. Which means the competence doesn't come from us. It doesn't come from our own ability. It comes from him. We are competent in him. It's his competence that allows us to live out his word and to live out the lifestyle that we ought to live. That's number one. And two, when you go to his word, don't just study it for the sake of studying it. Study it because you want God's word to change your life. Because you want relationship with him. You want to mature in Christ. And you want to be able to come alongside others so they can mature in Christ as well. Because we don't just make disciples to mature people. Or we don't just make disciples so that our church doesn't die. Or we, do, we just don't make disciples to fill the seats. We make disciples because that's who we are if we're in Christ. Do you see that? So back in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, he tells them, go and make disciples. They are now disciple makers full-time, whether you work a 40-hour job, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, anything that you do, you are to be making disciples. You are to be in relationship with others for the love of God and for the love of his people. So that's my challenge. That's my encouragement to you. But I don't think, uh, honestly, I, I feel like and I see, and after a lot of praying, I, I, I can definitely see that North Etowah Baptist Church, I think, has a lot of generations to come. And that's encouraging to me. I think North Etowah Baptist Church is on the right track. And I think, bit by bit, we can change the culture within our church. And bit by bit, we can change the culture in Etowah. So I did the math. If one person were to devote one person, their time to one person for a year, and at the end of that year, those two people were to devote a year, and they were to come alongside one person apiece, and if that were to go on, so on, so on, in 12 years, 4,000, I think I remember this correctly, I just looked it up, 4,096 people can be reached from just starting one person. 
That's more people that live in Adelaide. So in 12 years, the community of Adelaide can be reached. And the community of Etowah can serve King Jesus together. And it's all through disciple making. It's not through big events. Big events should serve at the pleasure of disciple making. So am I doing a big event to get people here? If I'm throwing an event for the youth, am I doing that to get people here? Or am I using that to make disciples? Two different things. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for just disciple making being the means to reach the ends of the earth. Um, I I thank you for just how relational you are and for how relational you are to each one of us. And so I thank you and praise you for the people that you have placed in each and every one of our lives to come alongside of us. And I pray that we imitate your son by making disciples who then go make disciples who then go make disciples. Father, 12 years seems like a long time to maybe a lot of people, but then if you follow that math, in 33 years, it's over 8 billion people that can be reached, which is more than what are on the earth right now. And so I thank you for how possible it is if we devote our time and our energy And our love, as Paul has done all those three with his example to your people. And so would we be convicted of that? And would we just not hear it? And would we not just read it? But would we actually go and do it? And so, Father, I I want to make myself available to to the people of North Edelbaugh and anyone else who either needs relationship with your son Jesus or just needs relationship with somebody to come alongside them. So use me however, use us as a congregation, however you please, for your glory and for your honor. We love you and we thank you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.